May the Lord be with you. Amen. And with these gracious words, we come and we mark this time together as sacred, as time to be renewed and refreshed and to be filled once again for life. Friends, a very special welcome to everyone this morning as we gather with the words of today's psalm, the psalm that we'll be hearing again and be singing um, during our prayer of confession. These words come to us today. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. Your you desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. As we gather in this sanctuary, we come to worship. And I invite you to fully arrive and be present here right now and to take the gift of this moment and the gift of life, the gift that the Lord has given us today, and to use it and to be transformed by this gift. If you're visiting us, just a very gracious and special welcome. We are so glad that you're here this morning. We'd like to get to know you by name, and so we have a small tool to help us with that. It's these blue friendship pads that are at the center of every aisle. Please take one, and particularly our members, I ask that you get that started. Um, pass that down so that you may greet one another by name during the passing of the peace and during our time of fellowship after church. As we leave the sanctuary, we have these new for Lent, purple friendship folders um, that we'd like for you to get to know a little bit more about our ministry. And we'd love to share this with you as you leave the sanctuary. Through the door on my right is a lounge in which all are welcome to join us for a time of fellowship after worship. We hope that you'll join us there. I have a few announcements to share in the life of our congregation. The first being that next Sunday is Palm Sunday, it's Passion Sunday. And that's the Sunday that we will be gathering our one great hour of sharing offering. There's an insert in the bulletin. This offering changes lives. It helps in hunger and disaster and development around the world. And so I just invite you to give generously to that. At both doors, as well as their information in your bulletin, um, Holy Week has some important, um, some spiritually significant moments for us to join in the journey together. Monday, Thursday, we will be at the Knolls, and we have a two-part evening. You can join us for the, um, both parts or the second part. The first part is a meal at the Knolls starting at 5.30. We'd love for everyone to join us for that, and if you can join us for the meal, please um, uh, fill out this sheet, and you can drop it in the, in the offering plate if you picked one up on your way in, or you can call or email the church so we can make sure that there is a place for you. All are welcome, without reservations necessary, to our time of worship, which will begin about 6.15 up at the Knolls. And then Easter Sunday is coming, April 1st, Easter Sunday. Can't wait to celebrate. And um, there is an opportunity to order special um, Easter flowers, as well as to contribute towards our special music fund. Again, um, you'll find both of these papers at both doors um, leaving the sanctuary. We now have two moments for mission. The first one, Diane Young, will share a moment for mission on behalf of the deacons for the upcoming blood drive. Diane? Good morning, friends. Good morning. Have you ever thought of the fact that the more some topics are mentioned, the greater their importance? <laughs> for the past several weeks, Information on the Deacon Spring Blood Drive has been advertised in our bulletins, Presby Newsletter, and The Voice. In addition, Pastor Lawrence has included the blood drive information as part of the Sunday morning announcements. Well, I am here to again remind everyone of the Tuesday, March 27, Spring Blood Drive, being held from 2 to 6, at the seminary. If you have not already done so, please consider registering online for an appointment. Information on how to do so is included in today's bulletin, or you may contact the church office for additional assistance. Our goal is 40 donors, and currently 13 individuals have made appointments. 
So please become a donor and encourage friends and family members to join you in helping to save lives by giving blood. Let me end with a quote from Albert Schweitzer. If affirmation for life is genuine, it will demand from all that they should sacrifice a portion of their lives for others. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Diane, so much. We have a second moment for mission on behalf of the Mission and Outreach Committee for not only a way that our mission our mission at the seminary is inviting the congregation, the community in, but a way that we go out to the community to serve. Danny? Through Dana, I could not be here today, so I'm going to give the mission for Habitat for Humanity. This Saturday, March 24th, the Oxford Presbyterian Church is committed to providing volunteers for the Habitat for Humanity Faith Build in Oxford. So we are inviting members of the congregation that are able to be a volunteer on Saturday the 24th. You be, be at the site at 8.30 and stay until cleanup time at 3 p.m. And if you know of non-members who are able to help, you can also invite the non-members to uh, help the Oxford Presbyterian Church in meeting our commitment. And ways you can uh, sign up is through the church office or Prudena, or you can go to the Cincinnati Habitat for Humanity website and sign up there. And for those who are not able to volunteer, we can also contribute mon money for the uh, Habitat. Our church is obligated for $8,000, committed for $8,000, so uh, you can make out a check and put OPC in the uh, main part uh, who you're making that check out to and habitat in the note field or if you prefer to donate cash put it in a pew envelope cash in a pew envelope and write habitat on the pew envelope well, i'd like to thank cy young for providing wraps for the 20 volunteers that will be at the habitat site this weekend thank you for your time thank you danny so many ways to serve. Now let us worship the Lord. Let us turn our hearts and our minds to worship our Lord.
Good morning. morning. And welcome to worship at Oxford Presbyterian Church on this fifth Sunday of Lent already. Whoever you are and wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. If you're a youth or a university student, an adult or an elder, you are one of God's beloved children. And wide is God's welcome to you in this place. Let us stand with the choir and with one another as we come to our call to worship. Let us gather to worship. O God, we wish to see Jesus. We come to worship, to pray, and learn. We come looking for Jesus in scripture lessons, in our own life experiences, in helping our world in prayers for each other. We seek to follow in the way of Jesus. We lay bare before God and one another our own wilderness journey, with filled with some gladness and hope, with reluctance and sorrow, with fear and confusion. O oh God, speak to us, show us, touch us with your presence. Let our Lenten journey lead us to Jesus, so that we may show Jesus forth in our lives, our faith community, and our world. O oh God, we wish to see Jesus. We come to worship the Lord. Let us turn for the first of our two gathering hymns, to hymn number 627, I Love You, Lord. Please remain standing and good morning. Good, morning. good friends, quite openly our actions that are part of the human condition turn us away from the love God always offers us. In this time of confession, Jesus invites us to examine all this and to repent, which really just means to turn back. O oh Lord, we pause, look within, and examine our conscience. Have mercy on us, O God, according to your steadfast love. Where we have neglected prayer, been apathetic in worship, found reasons to avoid generosity or lacked compassion, have mercy on us, O God, according to your steadfast love. Where we have colluded in the oppression of those who become invisible in their suffering and ignored on the streets, have mercy on us, O God, according to your steadfast love. Where anxiety has eroded the gift of your peace, and where we have cared too much about what others think, have mercy on us, O God, according to your steadfast love. Let us now take a moment of silence, followed by our sung confession from hymn 422, Create in me a clean heart.
Amen. Our gracious Lord teaches us to live and to move with God's wisdom, to open the doors of our hearts that will draw us deeper still to live in the truth that God desires. Here and now we begin again. We open wide the windows so that those who pass by will see Christ looking out. Thanks be to God. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you. Forgiven in Christ, please greet those around you with the peace of Christ be with you. If your neighbor is someone you have not yet met, please introduce yourself, for all are welcome in this place. Joy, joy. Is it working? Down in my heart. Down in my heart. Does someone need another bucket over there? All right. Down in my heart. I don't think it's <laughs> I've got the love of Jesus, love of Jesus down in my heart. Is it working? Yes, all right. Guess what? Today is the day that we are going to collect a few coins. And after that, we're going to do even something really majorly cool. Okay? So let's collect our coins because the need is still there. Are you ready? All right. Don't forget the choir. Thank you. <laughs> are you through collecting? the least coin offering on this third Sunday for the community meal that takes place at the end of the month. So all this will go to the community meal coming up in a few weeks. Collector. Lawrence is going to help with that. The pastor is going to help you. All right. And why? All right.
have some more snuggies up here. Yes, we do. I'm gonna come over this way. I have another snuggly right here. Yes. Dancing together in them. This, whoa, is very, very heavy. And we are thankful to this congregation for the amazing generosity that we see. And it's not only shown in the penny. Yes, I, we have four more snuggles that need to happen. Here's another snuggle. Yes. And here's another snuggle. And I have yet another one. Oh, are you okay? <laughs> here's that one. I have a few more. Let's see. Over here, if you see where Cornelia and Isabella are sitting, you know what they've been doing? They have been knitting. Do you know what knitting is? We talked about it before, right? We have talked about how you take a piece of yarn and you loop it a special way and it becomes something beautiful. So what they have been making, if you want to show them, is these. These are prayer shawls. We make them to comfort people. We make them so that if you are ill, or if you have lost someone, or if you're having a hard time, or anything like that where you need a snug, feel something warm around your arms, you get one of these. Cool, huh? I have one. Actually, I have two. <coughs> And my husband has one, and I got the privilege of finishing one that was started by a dear lady named Betty, but she couldn't finish it. And she is no longer in this place with us, as she's gone on to heaven. But I got to finish this one for her. So there's another snuggle. When you think about it, do you have to wear a certain piece of clothing to pray? Now, some people think when they hear the word prayer shawl, they have to have that to pray in. Nah. Nah. Right, Cornelia? What do we, what do, we do when we're making these shawls? Yes, we do. We do. We don't even know who it's going to go to. We don't even know if it's going to be a man or a woman or a boy or a girl. It doesn't matter. We just think about it who might need a prayer shawl. And we pray. I don't think we see any two alike up here, do we? Because it also celebrates how different we are and how beautiful we are to be different. I mean, nobody really would want to look like me. But they might. But it doesn't have to be that way. You don't have to look like me to pray. You don't have to have a prayer shawl to pray. But when you're making one, if you ever decide to make one, you'll pray. As a matter of fact, when she was Bella, before she grew up to be Isabella, and she sat up here on these steps, she was one of the kiddos, just like you. But then she got older, more grown up, and show them what you're doing. Now she's making the prayer shawls too. It doesn't matter who you are, if you can share that gift, it's yours to share. So, you know what I have to ha say, guys and dolls? That's actually a musical. But what I have to say is that when you want to pray, if you want to pray and participate in this ministry, you can also think of me and Cornelia and Diane and Karen and who else is making prayer shawls? Yes as we are praying together for people who need our presence and need to know that God is with them. Okay, that was a lot to talk about. I'm awfully glad that Noel and Lola brought their fish banks back because next week is 
Fish Bank Sunday. One great hour of sharing. And if you can't be here next Sunday, but you want to bring your fish bank in anyway, you can bring those in anytime. Also, next week is what? Palm Sunday. And what do we do on Palm Sunday? We have a parade. <laughs> all righty. Let us remember all those who we've made a shawl for and all those who might need a shawl. But come on, on up here. If you wrap that around your shoulders, which I'm going to do too, turn out from our circle and share a blessing with the congregation and they share one with us. I have a prayer, a blessing for anyone who might be getting a prayer shawl that we have here today or has already been given or will be given because I have heard when I visit women and men who might be at home or in the hospital or at the nursing home and they have a prayer shawl, they feel connected to us right here and right now. They feel connected to our congregation. And that comforts them so much. So I have a blessing for all the prayer shawls that have been made and will be made. Let's pray together. And if, if you have a prayer shawl in hand, you can go ahead and touch it. And if there's one beside you, you can touch that as well. Okay, let's pray together. May God's grace be upon this shawl, warming, comforting, and unfolding. May the one who receives this shawl be cradled in hope, kept in joy, graced with peace, wrapped in love. Blessed be your presence, O Lord. Amen. Okay, Carol. So now, because we can't keep these shawls to ourselves, right? We need to know that no matter who we are, and no matter where we go, that's right, no matter what you do, you are always loved and held in the embrace. All right, we're not twisting, but we are turning. If you can help me move the shawls out as you go to your classes, we will have our time in church school. Does the congregation have a blessing for these children? May God bless you here. And do we have a blessing for them here? May God bless you here. Thank you. <laughs> with you. That is amazing. Thank you. Please join me in the unison prayer for illumination. Shine upon us, God of glory, and by your spirit reveal to us the grace and truth of Jesus Christ in the word made flesh. Amen. In the beginning was the word. In preparation for Palm Sunday, Passion Sunday next week, the lectionary reading is drawn from the Gospel of John, a reading from John 12, 20 through 33. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls in the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. 
it, but if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will be my servant also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The pitch to a Hollywood producer might be as follows. There were reports of the walking dead, which prompt authorities to hatch an assassination plot against a young rebel with these seemingly otherworldly powers. Then just before one of the most important holidays of the year, some friends throw an extravagant dinner party at which a few things happen that scandalize the guests. Subsequently, the authorities double down on this assassination plot by hatching another plot, this one against the suspected zombie himself. Then a flash mob forms a spontaneous parade as the young rebel heads into the town to challenge the elites. That's just about a 90-second pitch to a Hollywood producer. But a biblical scholar might describe these same events with these words. A week before Jesus and his disciples arrive in Jerusalem for Passover, they stop in Bethany, where Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. This amazing act so infuriates the Pharisees and the priests that they openly talk about killing Jesus. A day or two later, Lazarus' sister Martha throws an amazing dinner party at which her sister Mary scandalizes the disciples by pouring perfume over Jesus' feet and then drying those feet with her hair. And with the news of Lazarus' miraculous recovery spreading as quickly as wildfire, those priests plotted to kill Lazarus and squash that inconvenient truth as well. But before these machinations came to pass, Jesus entered Jerusalem in preparation for Passover to much spontaneous pomp and circumstance that we'll hear a little, little more to about next week. You see, what John is saying is that people's responses to these events were intensely different. While the crowds spontaneously gathered to hear Jesus preach, others plotted against Jesus, trying to kill him. And the disciples' perspectives were changing as well. While many of the disciples were gaining a deeper understanding and being, becoming more committed to Jesus' mission, one of them, Judas, became increasingly frustrated and hostile. The momentum builds and builds until the scene Rick shared with us a moment ago when Jesus once more articulated his mission. The hour has come. The time has come. The season has come. These are all words translated from the Greek word hora, for time, season, hour. It is the time to which his entire life has been leading. The hour has come for the disciples to realize that the, this life is not about them or even about Jesus. The time has come for them to be fully and transformed by the reality that they are about life. And they are about the life that Jesus offers in relationship with God. 
The season has come in which the grains of wheat must die to what they are if they are to fulfill their purpose and to bear their fruit for harvest. Likewise, we as human beings must, in a sense, die to our own love for our own lives if we are to fulfill our purpose, our calling. So John's Gospel, the most philosophical and symbolic of all the four Gospels, were you just a bit turned around by that discourse that Rick read a moment ago? It's filled with symbolism. It's dense. It's like a philosophy class. But what John is wanting to do is to bring us into the truth of Jesus' presence as Jesus is in Jerusalem. And like the disciples and Greeks mentioned in this Passover, Jesus was not from Jerusalem. He's a pilgrim at that festival, that feast of Passover. However, unlike them, he entered the city for the final time and to face the hour of, shall we call, his glory that comes through his death and resurrection. For the time for curiosity has run out. The time for commitment is at hand in this passage. Jesus wants to know if some Greeks in the crowds and the disciples, if they really want to see him, the Son of Man who will die and be raised for the sake of them all. Jesus knows that curiosity about signs and wonders, that's easy. That's what captures headlines. That's what grows a crowd. But much harder and more precious is that commitment to follow, no matter the circumstances. And Jerusalem is the place where the choice between these two stances must be made. Did the Greeks really want to see Jesus, really see him, Or did they want to see what they thought he could do? In this season of much rhetoric and many causes, it's easy to be curious, to go from one headline to the next, from one rant and diatribe to the next. But to what, and more importantly, to whom are we truly committed and willing to stand with no matter what the cost? For what? And more importantly, for whom are we willing to lose our lives? In this season of much hubris and many false heroes, Jesus is modeling the spirit of humility that reveals that life is not about us. We are about life. The Mission is a movie from the 1980s that has long left a deep impression on me. The mission is set during the last days of the 18th century in a Jesuit mission built for indigenous people along the Paraguay River in South America. The story focuses on one of those missions which has been home to the Guaneri, an indigenous tribe. Jesuit missionaries had long worked among the Guaneri who were free under the Spanish law at the time. But when Portugal takes control of the area from Spain, The Portuguese government wants the Jesuits out and manages to finagle the Vatican officials into ordering the Jesuits to abandon their mission and the Guaneri. And under the authority of Portugal, there was little doubt that the Guaneri would be forced into slavery. The movie tells the story of our reading this morning of John 12 through the lives of two individuals, Father Gabriel, played by Jeremy Irons, and Father Mendoza, played by Robert De Niro. Father Gabriel sought to live out Jesus' commissioning of the disciples and their commitment to his mission. Father Gabriel lived this out by leaving his home in Spain and moving to South America and connecting with the Guaneri through the love of music, particularly beautiful flutes and recorders. Very much in contrast, Rodrigo Mendoza is cut from a different cloth. He left Spain as a mercenary in search of his fame and fortune. Mendoza brought no gifts to offer the people. He was intent on kidnapping and, to his best, enslaving, though not legally, the Guaneri, the very people that Father Gabriel had learned to love. After flying into a blind rage and killing his brother, Mendoza is consumed with remorse and wants to repent. So this 
this soldier of fortune turns around. He repents. And he gathers all of his weapons and his armor into a large net. And as an act of penance, Mendoza drags this net of armor and weapons up a cliff to the Guaneri mission where he once terrorized them at that Jesuit mission. Each step Mendoza takes is labored up that cliff. It takes him closer to his death and his resurrection. Just before Mendoza reaches the top of the cliff, he slips and he's in danger of being pulled down the cliff to his death by the weight of that armor and those weapons. And then suddenly a Guerrero warrior from that mission rushes up to him, holds out a knife, first holds it at his throat, and then he puts the knife to the back and cuts that burden of armor and weapons and lets it fall down the cliff. The act cleared the air from Mendoza. It forgave him the forgiveness that he sought. He took his religious vows and he joined the Jesuits as a priest. Then the troubles began that I mentioned earlier when Spain wanting to, I'm sorry, Portugal wanting to come and take over this mission. But when ordered to leave by the Portuguese, the Jesuit missionaries refused to leave. For they recognized that life is not about us. We are about life. Father Gabriel believed that the nonviolent response was best to this military aggression. Father Mendoza believed that the only choice they had was to take up arms again. Father Mendoza reached for his sword, which he thought that he had abandoned forever. And he sought out Father Gabriel and he said, Father, I've come to ask you to bless me. Father Gabriel responds, No. If you're right, you'll have God's blessing. If you're wrong, my blessing won't mean anything. If might is right, then love has no place in this world. It may be so. It may be so, he continued. But I don't have the strength to live in a world like that, Rodrigo. I can't bless you. Father Gabriel continued, he said, Rodrigo, help them as a priest, not a soldier. If you die with blood on your hands, Rodrigo, you betray everything you've done. You've promised your life to God, and God is love. Initially, Mendoza and Rodrigo and the Guaneri, they fight off the attack force just by being themselves. As time passed, it was clear that they were no match for the soldiers. Father Gabriel backed up his lofty ideals by putting his faith into action. When the Portuguese cross the river and prepare for the attack finally, Father Gabriel picked up a cross and led onto the battlefield those Guaneri who chose not to fight. The attacking soldiers who think of themselves as doing the will of God are shocked into stopping firing for a moment at the sight of a priest and a chorus of women and children singing, walking to them with a cross right in front that Father Gabriel carries. The soldiers hold their fire until the military commander ordered them, demanded them to continue their attack. On they walked, Father Gabriel, and that chorus of Guaneri women and men, children. They died alongside the defenders of the mission, but they did not betray their commitment to the mission. The historical events of this movie present two of the clearest choices before the followers of Jesus Christ as we prepare for our final steps of Lent. The time for curiosity has run out, and the time for commitment is at hand. We don't remember the names of those temple guards who in just a few days we will read about arresting Jesus in the garden. We don't remember the names of those soldiers that attacked the Guaneri. But we do remember the names of the apostles. We do remember the names of Father Gabriel and Father Rodrigo. We remember them because they made their commitment to walk with Jesus into Jerusalem. Today, Christ calls us to make the commitment to walk into Jerusalem with the Lord, 
to be instruments of change, to be the instruments of God's grace. Philip carried the gospel to Syria and Turkey and Greece. Andrew carried the gospel north to the Ukraine and to Russia. The disciples lived with gratitude and confidence. That gave Peter the confidence, who was once the denier, gave him the strength to travel to Rome. Nathaniel, the anonymous, traveled to Iraq and Iran. Thomas, the doubter, he traveled beyond Jerusalem to India. James the Unknown, he travels to Spain. Simon the Zealot, he travels southwest to Egypt. Each one so much further than their wildest dreams before they knew that their commitment would take them to those places. They realized as they walked into Jerusalem that their lives were not their own. Rather, their lives have been given them as a sacred trust. In this Lenten season, let us commit to being instruments of the Lord's change. We are the instruments of God's grace sent out to the north and the south, the east and the west, not to conquer, but to create. To create covenant communities of relationships that are about bringing out life. For life is not about us. We are about abundant Thanks be to God. Amen.
Amen. Please be seated as I'd like to invite Mickey Simons and Judy Fisher to join me around the font of baptism. It's wonderful to highlight the ministry of the deacons on this Sunday with the dedication, the blessing of the prayer shawls. Here we are, Judy. It's on and ready. And Mickey, you can stand in between us. The deacons do so much that is out of sight and behind the scenes of this church and yet is so vital for our our community, our fellowship as the body of Christ. Pastoral and prayer when those who are near the time of passing from this world and crossing into the threshold of eternity, deacons will be there at that time. Deacons send out dozens of cards and make dozens of visits every month. They prepare meals for family members who have been hospitalized or have just passed away. They prepare receptions after memorials and funerals. They sponsor the blood drive and the Lent and Advent food drives. They knit prayer shawls and so much more. We have an active and vital board of deacons here at Oxford Presbyterian Church. And Mickey, it is wonderful to be able to ordain and install you as a deacon of this church. Following the constitutional questions of Mickey and the questions of the congregation, the three of us will then come down to the floor of the sanctuary and I will invite all who have been ordained a deacon or an elder to come and lay hands on Mickey. This laying on of hands is a cherished and visible sign. It's a symbol, first of all, of our emphasis of lay leadership in the Presbyterian Church. Second, it is a symbol of the priesthood of all believers in the Reformed tradition. And third, it is a symbol of continuity of ministry all the way back to the apostles and disciples of Jesus Christ our Lord. Now please join me in the sentences of scripture from 1 Corinthians found in your worship bulletin. There are varieties of gifts, but it is the same Spirit who gives them. There are different ways of serving God, but it is the same Lord who is served. God works through each person in a unique way, but it is God's purpose that is accomplished. To each is given a gift of the Spirit to be used for the common good. Together we are body of Christ and individually members of it. We are called into the church of Jesus Christ by baptism and marked as Christ's own by the Holy Spirit. This is our common calling to be disciples and servants of our servant Lord. Within the community of the church, some are called to particular service as deacons, trustees, and elders. And through this, ordination is Christ's gift to the church, assuring that his ministry will continue among us, providing for ministries of caring and compassion in the world, and ordering the governance of the church. Representing Go ahead, keep speaking, Judy. the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, Oxford Presbyterian Church now ordains Mickey Simons, to the office of deacon and installs her to active service on the board of deacons. Mickey, I have a series of questions that those who have been ordained elders and deacons and pastors have been asked, and I now ask you. Do you trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior? Acknowledge him Lord of all and head of the church, and through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you? And do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ and the church universal and God's word to you? Do you? Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church as the authentic and reliable expositions of what scripture leads us to believe and do? And will you be instructed and led by these confessions as you lead the people of God? Do you and will you? Will you fulfill your office in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of Scripture and be continually guided by our confessions? Will you? Will you be governed by our church's polity and will you abide by its discipline? Will you? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? Will you? Will you, in your own life, seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? Will you? Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? Do you? 
And will you seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? Will you? And one more question. Will you be a faithful deacon, teaching charity, urging concern, and directing the people's help to the friendless and those in need? In your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? Will you? Do we, the members of this church, accept Mickey Simons as a deacon, chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ? Do we? We do. Do we agree to encourage them to respect Mickey's decisions, to follow her as she guides us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is head of the church. Do we? We do. Thank you, Judy. Now is the time. As Mickey and Judy and I come to the floor of the sanctuary, I invite all those who have been ordained as an elder or deacon to come and join in this symbolic moment of confirming the call of ministry through Jesus Christ our Lord. And lay hands on Mickey and one another. This is just one example that this church is the church of the people. And all are invited into membership and to be leaders of this congregation. Let us join our hearts in prayer. Gracious and eternal God, with joy we give you all thanks and praise. In every time and place you have chosen servants from among your people to point to the way of salvation. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon Mickey, that she may be a faithful deacon in the church. Give her an openness to the Holy Spirit's leading, that she may see and serve wherever there is a need. Train her in the school of prayer, that she may express the compassion of Christ for the poor and the friendless, the sick, the grieving, and the troubled. Equip her with courage to bear the gospel in the halls of power, and to communicate your presence and might among those who find themselves powerless. In everything, give her the mind of Christ, who did not grasp at greatness, but emptied himself to become a servant of your reign. Give her joy in her walk of faith and a sure sense of your abiding presence for her work in ministry. And now, as the people of God, we join our voices together in the congregational prayer. Gracious God, Pour out your spirit upon your servant, whom you have called through your baptism as your own and marked as your own. Grant her the same mind that was in Christ Jesus. Give her the gift of your Holy Spirit to build up the church, to strengthen the common life of your people, and to lead with compassion and vision. In the walk of faith and for the work of ministry, Give to your servants gladness and strength, discipline and hope, humility and courage, courage and an abiding sense of your presence. Amen. Mickey, you have now been ordained and installed as a deacon in the Church of Jesus Christ. Welcome to this ministry. Let us love and serve our Lord as we love and serve this body of Christ and the world that God so loves. Welcome in peace. Oh. For those who are able, you may welcome and greet Mickey and this ministry together, and then we will go into our time of prayers of the people. Welcome, Mickey. We come to our prayers of the people, and I just find our microphone here for the ushers. 
we invite you to share the joys and concerns that you have carried this week. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Amy. In the midst of our prayers, I will pause and invite each one of you, as you may have a joy, to share that. And then just a moment later, a concern as well. Let us join our hearts in prayer. God of covenant and commitment, thank you for guiding us over this Lenten journey as we learn again what it means to be a people in covenant with you. From the waters of the Red Sea to the wilderness of Sinai, from the waters of the Jordan River to the wilderness of Judea, O oh Lord, you have transformed your people. You have transformed us. And from the heights of Mount Sinai, you formed a people into a nation with the law, with the Torah. And in the spirit of our father Abraham and our mother Sarah, Lord, I now share the words of a prayer that we prayed together with our Jewish brothers and sisters at the wise temple yesterday. We heard these words of covenant in which we said together, there are no words more challenging than you shall be holy. There, are no, there is no command more basic than you shall love. No insight so fundamental as in the beginning God. No words life, so life enhancing as you shall rest. No cry more compelling than let my people go. No consolation more comforting than I am with you always. No vision more hopeful than they shall beat their swords into plowshares. Lord, we praise you and thank you that these words have outlived empires and monuments. And we thank you that these words now live in our hearts and our hands. Lord, I lift up this prayer of joy for the visit to the temple yesterday. Lord, in your grace, hear our prayers. Friends, if you have a joy to share today, I would invite you to lift that up, as I certainly want to start by sharing the joy for the ordination of Mickey Simons as a deacon. Lord, in your grace, yeah. hear our prayers. Other joys to share today. Other joys that you may have carried. Yes, Pam. I just want to say that next Sunday, Palm Sunday, we will have a donkey outside. That's right. So if um, those with little children especially want to come before the service, the donkey will be here between 9.30 and 10, and then it will make its way to the Episcopal Church and then to the Catholic Church. So it will be traveling around. So. <laughs> we have an ecumenical donkey coming. <laughs> and for the joy of Palm Sunday that leads into the meaning of Passion Sunday, Lord, in your grace, Hear our prayers. Other joys to share today. Brent. Thank you, Brent. Prayers of both joy and comfort. Joy for the life of Kay Ellis Jellison and for comfort um, for the family. Lord, in your grace and mercy, hear our prayers. We continue in prayer. Lord, we lift up many prayers of concern today that we have carried in our hearts for ourselves, our family members, our community, nation, and our world. Lord, I lift up many prayers of healing and wholeness today. Lord, we continue to pray for, for Jan and for Charles and for John. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Other prayers of concern to share today. Just raise your hand and the microphone will be brought to you. Um, we have a prayer from Mary and then from Nancy. Mary. Uh, I have noticed that Stacy Wynn has been on the prayer list that's in the bulletin for quite a long time and I just wanted to let you know um, I know her outside of the school um, made the introduction when we worked on vacation Bible school together a few years ago and I just wanted to let you know that the prayers are working oh, um, her mentally emotionally and physically she's starting to heal there's also healing going on in the family so I just wanted to say thank Amen. you Amen. thank you Mary prayers of both gratitude and continued prayers for the healing in Stacy Wynn's life. Lord, in your grace and mercy, hear our prayers. Nancy? My friend in Cincinnati asked me 
um, to help to call for prayers for Yolanda, her neighbor. Yolanda and her husband are going through a long um, adoption, which should be finalized next month, but Yolanda has discovered she has stomach cancer, and they're scared to death that that news will um, have bad repercussions for the adoption. So Yolanda and her family need your prayers. Thank you so much, Nancy. Prayers for Yolanda and her family. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Other prayers today. I lift up a prayer for healing in the life of Daryl Payne, as well prayers of comfort, uh, the passing of the father of Mark DiGennaro. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Lord, in this time, we pray that you would engrave your word on our hearts again. And then, Lord, break our hearts open for what breaks your heart, that your word might sink in and that may become part of us, so that we would follow Jesus into Jerusalem for this time of commitment in the holy days ahead. We pray this in the name of Jesus the Christ, who taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. A group of us went from this congregation to the Plum Street Temple yesterday, also known as the Wise Temple. And there, in beautiful space, we got to hear a 13-year-old girl read from the Torah for the first time in her life in Hebrew. And her passage was about first fruits. And she talked about first fruits and how we give our very best to God. And I thought, that's what we do every Sunday. That's what we do every day. So now we have the opportunity to give our first fruits our very best. And we as a church, Accept the invitation and the challenge to share these resources that Jesus has so graciously and generously given to us. Let us give, as we are able, of our first fruits to the ministries of this congregation.
Thank you for your generos generosity to our congregation's ministry and mission. Let us join our hearts in prayer as we dedicate our lives and our offering today. God, there are many who wish to see Jesus. In joy and celebration of the many gifts that we share, we ask you to bless all of our offerings. May Jesus shine in all the world. Amen. Let us stand and sing together hymn 767, Together We Serve. United by love, a beacon of hope, a lamp for the heart, a light for the feet. Friends, this is what we seek to be as the body of Christ. And as we go after our blessing that Rick has for us, all are welcome to carry these into fellowship, into the lounge, and then out into the world for our commitment to serve. Rick? Dear God, we thank you for today, for being with us accepting our worship and prayers, and for guiding us on our way. Bless, bless us, us as we go, we go. And, and in turn, turn may we bless, bless others. In Jesus' name, amen. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forever. Amen. <laughs>